I really feel that people can recover in their own time. I feel peer support is everything. Most important for recovery is having uh, somebody who believes in you, somebody who loves you, someone you can love, uh, someone who understands you. We really needed to, to stand up, just like the civil rights movement for people, African American people, or the civil rights movement for women. We needed a civil rights movement for people with psychiatric diagnosis, with a psychiatric label. I was first put locked up on December 4th, Sunday, December 4th, 1960, at about noon, driven out to this hospital in Massachusetts, which I didn't even really realize where I was going because I'd first been taken to the Mass General Hospital after doing it, having an overdose, really depressed, taking an overdose of aspirin taken to the Mass General by my parents because I was really sad and lonely and had overdosed. And then the psychiatrist came and said to me, we're going to send you to a sanitarium. And I thought, I guess I have TB, you know. I mean, I didn't even know what it meant. There were huge numbers of people in institutions at that time, and the conditions under which they lived were, number one, they were used as forced labor. Um, many of them were shock treated, many of them forced with medications, and also many of them were dying, and there were no investigations, there were no real reasons as to why people were dying. Um, the Network Against Psych Psychiatric Assault put out a newsletter called Madness Network News that started to go out all over the country and joined other um, inmates, other uh, survivors, if you will, people that were being deinstitutionalized de and were gathering in different cities. I first heard about uh, the movement uh, when I was reading a, a, a newsletter at the library that came out from a group called the Radical Therapist. And it was a group of, of psychologists, primarily, uh, who had formed a commune, a collective in Boston area, I believe. And they were exploring different ways, alternative treatments. Uh, they came kind of from a left political viewpoint, and they thought that there could be more democratic, less autocratic ways for them to practice as mental health professionals. Uh, and they didn't even, they, though they were very progressive, they didn't think about the idea that we, we might be able to run our own services. Uh, but they at least were thinking about people with mental illness, people with psychiatric diagnosis uh, in a different way and trying to figure out a different way uh, to provide those services. Um, through that magazine, I heard about the International Conference on Human Rights and Against Psychiatric Oppression. And that was very exciting to me. I, that, I, that kind of appealed to the, to the new agey, lefty, uh, 60s kind of fellow that I was. So I got on an airplane and went to, their, to, the, to my first meeting. I think it was maybe their 10th meeting. Uh, and that, that meeting was in Toronto, in Canada. And uh, there I met Judy Chamberlain and David Oakes and a lot of the people that are still uh, active. Judy's no longer with us, but people that were, some people like David who are still active in organizing. And they were very much into a, 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 an anti-psychiatry approach. In fact, they use the term anti-psychiatry, though right now that's probably not a term that people use. But the idea that we needed to challenge the psychiatric oppression system that was tied up with the big drug companies and was, you know, part of the state uh, machine of oppression. I think a really big, big um, event was meeting Judy Chamberlain. And um, our movement is a person-to-person -person movement. It's, it's, um, a, it's kind of a spiritual movement. It's, a, a, it's the force and the energy and the enthusiasm and passion for, of person-to-person, -person, goes person-to-person. -person. And she, transmitted her spirit, I feel like I still carry it with me. 
Um, and uh, 1970, I remember very clearly uh, how I met her. Um, it was through a client, handed me a form to be filled out, a Social Security form. She said, now look inside this form. And inside was a flyer for Judy Chamberlain's book. Um, and it's, a, it's still today, on our own, uh, um, ex-patient controlled alternatives to the mental health system. I find writing, a lot of people, some people who write, Writing becomes real easy for them. Mm -hmm. I find writing really difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, you sit there, it's you and the typewriter and this blank piece of paper. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. <laughs> you want to do just about anything but look at this blank piece of paper anymore. Yeah. Um, but I really um, kept at it. And uh, while I was working, I kept thinking, there are people out there, there are mental patients and ex-mental patients and potential mental patients who are going to read this book and it's going to make a difference in their lives. Which it sure has, yeah. And, and, you know, and then part of me would say, yeah, sure, come on, don't be so grandiose and mm -hmm. start putting words on the paper instead of daydreaming. Mm -hmm. But the most gratifying thing has been over the years, the letters and phone calls from people that I've gotten that said, this book really helped me. This book hooked me up with things and this book let me know that I wasn't alone and this book sure. told me that there was another way and this book told me that I wasn't crazy. Mm -hmm. And so we got in the car. I'm sitting in the front seat. 1960, you know, one seat, three people in the front, father driving, mother over here, and me, 19 years old. And we get out to this farmhouse in the middle of the woods, and I realize suddenly we go in, and people are dressed in white. You know, there's this nurse, and she told me to take off my belt. At that moment, give her any, you know, pens, pencils, take off my belt. Then I knew, wait a minute, this is not good. I knew immediately, but I didn't even half know what was about to happen. So there I was, and within a few days, I mean, I literally stopped talking because I was so petrified. And within a few days, they said I was schizophrenic, and they started giving me insulin shock, electric shock. One of these times when I was in solitary confinement, I remember, uh, I've told this many times, looking at the impenetrable steel screen at the window on day two or day three or something like that. And I just remember pounding that, that screen, and I know nothing was gonna happen, but I pounded it and I said, when I get out of here, I am gonna, I'm gonna do something to change this. Many demonstrations were held. Um, again, they were being held in different parts in Philadelphia and New York City. Um, in the West Coast, in um, Kansas, and also again in San Francisco and the, and the Bay Area. One of them was a demonstration uh, that, that took place in, at that time, Governor Jerry Brown's office. And it was quite an undertaking in that um, we, we took over his, not his office, but part of the lobby area, as I recall, it's kind of hard because at this point, it's uh, maybe 40 to 50 years, I don't want to say 50, but it might be, um, at least 40 years ago. Um, but what I recall is our being in a long hallway and our uh, uh, sleeping bags lined up on either side, um, a protest that wasn't going to give up. What was day one like for the mental patient liberation movement or the consumer movement or whatever they want to call it nowadays? Well, day one was um, <laughs> when there was a woman by the name of Dorothy Weiner who was living in Portland, Oregon, who had this idea that uh, the way she was treated in mental hospitals and the way other people were treated in mental hospitals wasn't right and uh, that there were better ways that people should be treated and there were alternatives that people needed to be created. Uh, alternatives to mental hospitals to the psychiatric system and uh, later on she got uh, some articles printed in a local underground paper called the Willamette Bridge and brought together some people in a group called the Insane Liberation Front. Uh, this is in late 1970, early 71 and uh, <coughs> basically uh, they tried to distribute literature in mental hospitals and they had an 11 point program because a lot of people had 10 point programs and they had to be <laughs> different. Um, an 11 point program that involved uh, things like an end to involuntary commitment, an end to forced drugging, um, uh, information about medications, 
alternatives, which you would call freak-out centers that are now called drop-in centers or client-run centers. Uh, a lot of the same things that the movement is believing in now. Uh, she uh, got the group started, and, and I was living in Eugene, Oregon at the time, which isn't too far from Portland, and went up to Portland to meet her and was kind of, I found my calling, was my whole life changed at that point. And I decided that, I, that this would be what I would do for the rest of my life. Went back to New York City, uh, started the Insane Liberation Front in New York City, uh, printed an article called The Insane Manifesto in a very new paper called The Radical Therapist Journal. It was new at that time, mm -hmm. coming out of Boston. And uh, later on, we changed the name of the organization to the Mental Patients Liberation Project, which got some national media attention and then groups started springing up all around the country. Uh, Dorothy, uh, we tried to stay in touch with her. Um, several years later, we learned that she had died um, and that she never really knew because we could never reach her. We, she never really knew that what she had started had grown into what is now an international movement. Well, eventually we advocated with the community support program because they had a, 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 this learning community conference and we would go, we'd be invited, a group of us, uh, eventually there were about 60 or so of us coming to the Learning Community Conference, which happened I think every other year, and about the third conference that I was involved in, we had about 60 or so uh, consumers, survivors, ex-patients uh, gathered uh, at that conference, and we did a caucus. We were just one third of the conference. And we, in our caucus, we said, shouldn't we have a conference of our own? Shouldn't there be an opportunity for these emerging groups to come together and organize on a national basis, maybe even create a national organization. Sort of like National Alliance for the Mentally Ill was for family members, we thought there should be a National Mental Health Consumers Association for consumers. So we went to the Center for Mental Health Services and asked them to fund a conference, and they agreed and the, they funded a conference that was uh, hosted by the On Our Own group in Baltimore, and it was a conference in Baltimore. And we thought maybe we'd get 50 or 60 people. And I think we ended up with nearly 500 people from all over the United States at this first national uh, conference that we ended up calling the Alternatives Conference because we were looking for ways to create alternatives within and without the mental health system. 1985 was a big year, actually. 1985, the federal government for the first time funded a, the first alternatives conference. It was in Baltimore, and I just happened, I, I grew up in Baltimore, I happened to be in Baltimore at the time, and uh, somebody said, well, stop on by. So I stopped by, and then somebody said, uh, pointed me out and said, you should get up and say a few words. <laughs> and I was like, well, okay, I'll say a few words. But I was not in the inner circle of probably two dozen leaders at that time that were jockeying for what will be the nature of the future for this movement. And um, they had a big meeting uh, and had a lot of anger and fights about two ba basic branches, two basic takes. And uh, on the one hand, there were the survivors, psychiatric survivors, who said, we've been damaged, the system's broken, throw it away, we'll do our own thing, goodbye. And they were called sort of the anti-psychiatry group. And on the other hand, you had the consumers, mental health consumers, who said, well, we just need, you know, kinder, gentler system and, you know, supports, but the system's basically all right. And they formed two groups, two different national groups at that time. National Association of Psychiatric uh, Survivors, NAPS, and National Association of Mental Health Consumers, NIMCA, something like that. And they each had their own leaders and they fought, tooth and nail. There were four, they put us then in a little, no longer in the farmhouse, but we were taken into kind of a little cement barracks kind of place, it was like one cement structure with a day room, nurses behind glass, like two nurses behind glass, and two other rooms with four beds in each. And there were four of us girls, teenagers, all of us. No boys, just girls. Every morning, woken up at six in the morning, dressed in johnnies, lay down on our backs on these beds, 
they would give us an injection of insulin, which was supposed to put us in a coma. But they start out with just a little bit, so you don't really go into a coma for quite a while. And so many days would go by before I actually went into a coma. There were, so there were big, big changes. We also started collaborating more. Um, and from the eight, oh, and some things, as I said, that stopped. For instance, the first year of Alternatives Conference was in 1985. And that was the last year the International Conference on Human Rights and Against Psychiatric Oppression met. And that's not a coincidence, is those old tools created an environment that new tools of organizing were fit. Um, uh, the uh, Madness Network News stopped being published in, 19, in yeah, 1986 um, because there were so many groups and there was a different ways of organizing. I think they built what we have today, but they had, they had, that's what they had done. They had built the next, they changed the environment so much that you needed other ways of organizing. Then three times a week, the shock, the ECT, electroconvulsive therapy doctor would come in with a, like, he had a black suit on, he had a little black suitcase, and in that suitcase was the shock machine, which I now realize because I now I've done research and I know what it looks like that's what he was carrying in his little black suitcase and he would put it behind my head and hook me up you know with these electrodes and no anesthesia back then and then they would have a nurse on each limb holding me down it gets really emotional because it was so horrible it's like horrible and then they would say, is everybody ready? But they weren't talking to me, was I ready? You know, they were talking to the people holding me down, were they ready? And, um, and so then they would zap me. And when I came to, I would, have, I would throw up, vomiting, 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 have a terrible, terrible headache. And this went on for six weeks, basically. And, and about halfway through, my 17-year-old roommate literally died in the bed next to me, and they had killed her. There are consumer-run programs across the country. Um, while with Madness Network News, there was a list on one page of the consumer-run programs, one page. Um, now there are three technical assistance centers funded by the federal government just to keep track. <laughs> of all the consumer-run programs um, and keep track of them and also offer them peer support. Um, what's interesting is I can see the fruition of so many of our ideas, but I also can see new ideas that we did not have at the time, um, such as uh, consumers working in the mental health system. We would never have conceived of that, nor would we have wanted to on those campgrounds because the mental health system was our enemies. If someone had talked about the idea of consumers working in the mental health system would have, would have worked work there. I mean, <laughs> we had a grant to train six states in patient rights law, and um, that was significant um, because um, uh, when um, when we organized the um, eighth annual conference on human rights and psychiatric oppression, we had, we had this money to train states to be trained around patient rights because of my involvement of getting that grant. We, we had the most consumer survivor groups did not want any money from the federal government. I, had, I was organizing this conference at, um, at, uh, in Berkeley, the Coalition Against for, uh, the California, excuse me, National Conference on Human Rights Against Psychiatric Oppression. We were having our conference in Berkeley. CAF was the one organizing it. I was being very involved with it, but yet because I was now working for the National Paralegal Institute, they were actually wanting to, a couple people uh, wanted to bar me, ban me from the conference, uh, David Oakes being one of them. And so the government um, wanted one group. They, they, they didn't like having all this, these warring factions. And, um, and also the government saw at uh, NIMH, in fact, was at that point the, the, the entity of the government, ironically, that was supportive of this, this movement or the, some of it. 
And they wanted uh, representatives that they could work with because they saw, started to see that their advocacy especially could come from those of us who lived experience. And um, there was a woman in the government actually at NIMH uh, named Jackie Parrish who played a very important role in uh, nurturing sort of uh, from the outside and very respectfully some of the uh, early um, uh, leaders to, to get involved in policy and not just be outside, you know, throwing stones. And I'm literally always looking to try to find people who were locked up with me. In all these years, it's been more than 50 years, I have never found anyone who was locked up in those four mental institutions with me. But there's always hope that maybe at these conferences or somewhere I'll find, I'll find somebody. We've, we've worked with the system, against the system, around the system. Um, and my friend Howie the Harp used to say, real reactions to real life problems.